When it comes to data engineering, most people prefer to talk about data modeling or automation. But another area that I feel is equally as important and often overlooked is what I like to call the landing zone. And the landing zone is where your source data first lands in your database or wherever you're storing your raw data. And it's what's ultimately going to serve as the foundation for the rest of your pipeline. But for some reason, a lot of companies like to quickly move past this part of the stack. And I believe overlooking this too much can cause a lot of mistakes later on in your architecture. So in today's video, I want to break down three reasons why paying attention to this landing zone is going to be a huge benefit for your architecture overall. Reason number one might seem obvious, but it has to do with structure and establishing scalable conventions early on in your pipeline. The approach I see a lot of teams following is that they will just simply mimic the naming convention of whatever the source is in their database. You basically just stick to whatever the name of the source says it is without thinking too much about what you might want to call it instead within your landing zone. While this might seem easy at first and something you can kind of just fly through at the beginning, the problem is as you add more and more sources, a lot of these names are going to get mixed up. They're going to be scattered throughout your database. They may not really make a whole lot of sense. So when somebody new joins the team or somebody else is trying to look at the database, they might not immediately understand what a particular database or schema represents. And in my experience, this is one of the fastest ways to start making a mess of your database, which again is why I think it's so important to pay attention to this landing zone. Instead, I think the landing zone is a great place to establish your initial naming conventions. So for example, something as simple as creating a separate database that's just called raw or whatever you want to call it to indicate that it's for raw data only. And then all the underlying schemas in there are named based on their source. But at least in that case, they're grouped together all within a raw database so you know exactly what it represents. Or if you have everything already in one database, you could prefix all of your raw data with raw underscore and then the name of the source. It might sound really simple, but even just this simple naming convention alone can add a lot more organization to your database and just allow other people to understand exactly what's going on. Plus, it can scale much easier for more sources because you know exactly the convention you're going to follow. You just rinse and repeat that same convention for any new source rather than just blindly throwing it in your database and naming it however the source is telling you to name it. As my dad would say, this is something that I believe is easy to do but easier not to do, which is why I think a lot of people tend to overlook this, but when done with intention can be a great place to establish conventions in your architecture. Number two has to do with security and that having a clear landing zone that's structured helps to simplify security roles and permissions. For example, let's say you follow the strategy that we talked about in the previous section, you can very easily assign specific permissions to just those objects. For example, if everything is in a raw database or everything's in the raw schemas, those are the only areas where you need to assign permissions to the different loading tools that you use. The approach I tend to follow is I'll create a single role called loader, which is kind of the bucket for all of the permissions, but then there are different users for each of the different tools that I use that get assigned to that overarching role. So it helps you stay organized and avoids those users and those tools from having access to anything else accidentally further on in your pipeline. And all of that happens because you've been specific and intentional about your landing zone, as opposed to, again, just randomly giving access to a specific admin user or not having anything organized in your database. You can be more specific and more intentional about the design. And now to finish this off, number three is that all this is going to align very nicely with your data transformation project. For example, I like to use dbt quite a bit. And in there, you have different subdirectories for your different sources. In that case, if you have your raw data very organized and separated by sources, it's very easy to align, let's say your DBT or whatever tool project with those sources directly and build on top of that. So as a user, when you're in the project and developing, you can very easily relate it back to the database without a lot of questions. Everything's clear, it's simple, it's elegant, and it makes your development life just so much easier. When you actually look at this from a higher level, when you're intentional about the landing zone of your project, the mentality and the organization and just the overall structure of how you start there is going to trickle down into the rest of your project. Why would you only establish these kind of conventions in one part of your project and not the rest? So if you're making that effort in the landing zone, it's going to apply to your data modeling. It's going to apply to the Mart Slayer. It's going to apply to your reporting and all across the board because you're effectively setting the foundation for what the rest of the stack is going to look like and what your expectations are. I encourage you to make the effort to revisit your current landing zone and understand if you're following these types of things or where you can introduce some new ideas to improve your current design. So hopefully you found this helpful and got some new ideas. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.